Quincy McCoy. Um, so at various points you emphasized um, the uniqueness uh, as a desideratum for measures. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to ask you more about that because it seems like it, you could have a small set of measures that, that agree, that are all physically motivated and, and agree on the cosmological results. Um, and that, that might be enough. Uh, and then it seems like you might have a case that's more analogous to the case in uh, justification of measures in statistical mechanics or something like that. So why did you want to insist on uni uniqueness so much? Right, so uh, I guess if you had a class of measures that agreed in all respects on some set of observations, that would be, uh, that would be all right. And yeah, there are indeed several different measures that you use in different contexts in statistical mechanics. The worry was rather that the, um, if the, 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 the measure isn't determined either uh, isn't well motivated from the underlying physics or is allowed to take values such that the measure leads to very different types of predictions, then you could always hold on to the underlying theory which you're taking to lead to a particular ensemble and just change, uh, adopt one of those other measures if you got a particular prediction that was incorrect. So it's, it's really just the crude picture that if you have the measure as sort of a free floating piece of the package that leads to these predictions, then it's a standard sort of worry about uh, well, that can be changed without affecting the other underlying theory. So it's hard to see how the underlying theory is being tested. Um, so if you had a, a collection of measures that all agreed on some set of observations, then that wouldn't be an issue. So uniqueness is too strong. It's probably uh, uniqueness up to you know, uh, agreement on the, the, the anthropic predictions of interest. I have a question about the slide where you pointed out that uh, anthropic predictions are uh, often argue to be non-sensitive to changes mm. in the ensemble on, and in the measure. And you, you argued that that was a, rise, a, a vice rather than a virtue because mm -hmm. it doesn't single out any particular multiverse model. And I'm, I completely agree with that. I just wondered if, um, if there is a similar move where you could say, well, um, it would be interesting though if, for example, the predictions um, are less sensitive with regard to changes in mu than with regard to changes in the ensemble or vice mm. versa. So then that would still be not you know, satisfactory, but it would uh, suggest that there might be something, you know, at least a subset of all of the multiverse scenarios that is being picked out there. Yeah, there would be a way of being more fine-grained in the assessment here. So what I'm referring to in terms of what people say is often a kind of hand-wavy argument. They say something to the effect, well, look, you might worry about exactly how to define the anthropic class, but then you see when you do the calculation that you could take wildly different uh, assumptions about the reference class and you get essentially the same result. And so, so that's the sort of claim of robustness, which uh, I think you know, is, uh, is a response to the worry that you don't want to have it, the results depend too sensitively on this. But as I said, I think um, it also means that perhaps it doesn't depend sensitively on things that you would want it to depend on. Um, but I think you're right, you could per perhaps be more fine-grained in trying to assess, given some theories and consideration, how, how much they are robust to different changes. Thank you. Thank you for the very nice talk. Firstly, I think you've proved quite conclusively that inflationary theory is a branch of philosophy. <laughs> because <laughs> basically, the, all of your arguments all had a philosophical step in them. Every mm -hmm. single one of those arguments had a philosophical step. Uh, the second point is the eliminative argument. Mm -hmm. um, I've argued <laughs> in this in Oxford quite recently that unimodular gravity or the trace-free equations mm -hmm. is a way right. which gets around that. It is a possibility which is out there and it solves that problem. So the eliminative right. argument does not work because there is an alternative. And right, and just to be, I didn't mean to be endorsing it and I agree that there's issues about taking the cosmological constant problem to force yeah, you into the yeah. uh, multiverse picture. Uh, and totally the final agree. problem, which I would just like to mention, in inflationary theory, V of phi is treated basically as a free thing that you can adjust right. as you like. It's not tied into physics, mm -hmm. uh, except in one case, and that is that the recent very beautiful analysis of the Encyclopedia Inflationaris has emphasized that non-minimally coupled Higgs field is a possible inflaton. In that case, and only in that case, is a potential V phi tied into established and well-known physics. Hmm. Thank you. I, 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 I totally agree that the, the question of 
Um, exactly how to specify inflation has been something that people have been quite loose about and have used a variety of toy models. And I think if you actually had it coming out of a particular effective potential, then you'd have predictive content associated with the theory in a way that you don't if you just treat it as a free function. I totally agree. Joe Silk, I completely agree that it's essential for predictions uh, uh, to be sharp. The one that's the most widely cited, as we've heard in the past two days, is that of a cosmological constant. Mm -hmm. And this is an example of one that's incredibly fuzzy. For example, um, the prediction really can't even get the sign correct um, because there is the, 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 there's really no significant lower bound. Um, if, once you impose one, you can't mm -hmm. uh, convince yourself that it has to be a positive. So it's hard to believe that's a successful prediction that's been verified by cosmologists. So the you mean the, the Weinberg prediction? The Weinberg prediction, yeah. that's right, yeah. Yeah. No, I agree, and I think a lot of the anthropic predictions have that kind of fuzziness, which is exactly the, one of the problems. Thank you. Well, with the, uh, this question of the, of the potential of, of inflation, of course, mm -hmm. If, if we say it, well, there is an, a field that is the inflaton, and we do not have uh, any um, experimental or empirical access to, to that field, that is a very mm -hmm. different case as if we speak of the electrodynamical field or whatever, we, which we can detect in, in the lab. So on the, on the other side, there is uh, this, uh, this softness, for example, in the history of uh, of, of, the, of the thinking about uh, uh, the geometry of, of space-time in the last uh, 20 years, there have been some changes. Sometimes people have thought the universe is, is the open, sometimes it is uh, flat, uh, and so on. And when those changes in fashion have taken place, always the inflaton could be adjusted, uh, adjusted mm -hmm. to, <laughs> to provide the fashionable result. So it is something uh, uh, completely soft. But uh, my, my, I wanted to ask you whether you think that uh, these uh, similar uh, problems are problems for et et eternal inflation or just for inflation to court eternal or not eternal. Perhaps uh, uh, <clears throat> the problem is not uh, with the eternality of inflation. Right, right. No, I, so um, partly I just, for focusing on the question at hand, was taking, taking it as given that uh, there's a certain amount of success of the inflationary picture and then thinking of the further implication of eternal inflation. But I think you're right. You can stop the step earlier and ask what is the... Uh, what is the empirical case in favor of inflation and how strong is that? And I agree with your sentiment that if it's this incredibly flexible paradigm, and there's the phrase paradigm without a theory, right? Because it's just the very flexible idea that you could have a scalar field. And uh, George has an early paper on this where you just show any expansion history can be traced back to uh, a particular effective potential. So in that sense, it's quite flexible. Um, so I think there, there, there's important questions and then if you, Partly, I was focusing on the indirect case in favor of eternal inflation. If you kick away the success of inflation, then you also, of course, kick away the case for eternal inflation. There's another point which I think is more, um, perhaps more relevant, which is uh, how do you think of the original predictions of inflation? Are those themselves anthropic predictions which depend upon selecting the appropriate initial conditions for the inflaton field? Right? So uh, if you think now of the initial conditions of inflation as being set in different ways in all the different parts of the uh, universe, then I think the predictions of eternal inflation end up having some of the same problematic features of the anthropic predictions that I was talking about um, because they end up being a, a feature that's been selected um, due to our existence. And so then I think the worries about anthropic predictions uh, carry over to the, uh, the well-known <coughs> predictions of inflation. Yeah, the, this links with the last question because mm. I look at one argument you gave um, from Guth, I think, for eternal inflation rather than just inflation is the notion that stochastic fluctuations in the vacuum are going to drive mm -hmm. the inflaton field right. up the potential well as well as down it. 
Um, I just wonder whether uh, you labelled the stochastic, mm -hmm. stochastic inflation. Stochastic inflation, right? Yeah. Does Guth the himself figure use the, that the term? figure was from Guth. It's uh, Linde yeah. who developed that more specifically. But specifically with the terminology stochastic inflation. Um, yes, Stochasticity, Linde and Lincoln right. both right. So use that, yeah. it's very explicit, is it, that the notion of the vacuum here is one which is stochastically, probabilistically. Evolving in time. Yeah, is the that, stochastic is that, right? is that you're modeling the fluctuation a particular way. You have an equation where you're mod modeling the quantum fluctuation up the hill is just a stochastic jump. Right, but essentially it's a quasi, -cl a quasi classical yeah, stochasticity, yeah, exactly. right? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I just want to make the comment really that N N Nemo uh, Akani Hamad, he, mm -hmm. he was talking about violent fluctuations in the vacuum as well the last mm -hmm. couple of days. I did push him on this, um, and he strongly denied that he had any stochastic picture here. Ah, okay. Okay, so whatever's meant by vacuum uh, energy and indeed the word, the terminology fluctuations, for, 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 for Nemo, at any rate, this is mm -hmm. nothing, there's nothing happening as he put it. Ah, okay. So some, some, it's, that's interesting. I mean, the reason I raise it, of course, is because it does seem to me that the status of the vacuum and whether or not it is stochastically fluctuation, fluctuating is interpretation dependent vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. quantum theory. Right, no, I, I, I uh, agree with that issue. Just to be clear, though, I think the... The stochastic fluctuation here is of the inflaton field um, as it's moving down the classical potential. So there are, way, th there are reasons why that calculation is problematic that have nothing to do with the particular issue of vacuum fluctuations. So there are questions about whether you can self-consistently describe that evolution. A lot of people argue against stochastic inflation because they think that the equations of motion, and it also it usually has to be a large field value at which you're considering the fluctuations. So there, there are reasons why people don't accept this calculation um, separate from the question of interpreting vacuum fluctuations. Right, right. But th there are independent ways of getting eternal inflation yeah, short the, of string theory? or Yeah, so I think... Um, or does only string theory give an alternative route to eternal inflation? Well, string theory is a quite different route, which is why I said that people seem to assume that it gives you a similar global causal structure, this bubbles within bubbles picture. But the story is quite different. Um, within inflation, you have different stories that correspond to, in effect, different shapes of the effective potential and different effects that would basically keep the potential from globally going all the way down to the minimum at the same point, which is what you'd need to have in order for inflation to stop everywhere globally. And so there are different, these tunneling and uh, topological inflation pictures are ways of keeping it from globally going down to the true, true minimum. Thank you very much. Yeah.